Well, I'm going to try to be a punctual person for once. And um, we will get this thing started. And I get to introduce myself. But uh, two things before we get started. First off, I'm going to imagine that some of you have taken a class from me before or are taking a class right now. Are any of you enrolled in my class right now? Just one? I have 430 students in my class right now. One of them showed up. You get an A. Um, any of you take my class previously? Oh, I'm so flattered. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to introduce myself a little more thoroughly uh, in a moment here. But I, mostly I want to explain to you what this series is, what the speaker series is. It's the Degrees to Anywhere. Am, am I supposed to explain why we have that particular phrase? It's because one of our crappy state senators called a degree in the liberal arts a degree to nowhere. Um, and so we're trying to say, which was funny because he had one. Um, and anyhow, um, but the idea of degrees to anywhere, yeah, it's true that if you're in the humanities, the social sciences, the liberal arts, very often that degree in and of itself will not give you a direct professional qualification for something. But really, the whole point of coming to college is not to get your professional credential. I mean, that's what, that's what a technical school is for. It's to become educated. And when you get your degree in the humanities, the social sciences, the liberal arts, what it does is it prepares you for a huge number of things. And so the point of this speaker series is to learn from people who have a background in one of these fields and have gone on to something that maybe you wouldn't have expected at first to see that it does prepare you for a lot of things. Now, I know it's a little weird hearing that from a psychology professor, but I will explain why I'm why I am here uh, talking today. So this is a, Stephen, this is a monthly event, correct? Uh, three times each semester. Three times each semester, okay. So if nothing else, it's free lunch three times a semester. So just remember, this is where all the food is, <laughs> all right? It's like my daughter, all three of my kids are students here. And, but I have one daughter who has said, like, they give out free fresh fruit and vegetables on Fridays. Right, so she just like goes and stocks up and she knows where all the free food is. I mean, she's not a starving student. We support her, uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of free food to be had on campus and we've got a lot in this room. So I will not be offended if you get up and go back and get some food while I'm talking. Okay. Also, just a quick note, this talk will is being recorded. So you can share it with all of your friends and watch it again and again. I actually, um, I make videos, and I had somebody who was from Pakistan tell me that she puts my data videos on repeat to help her child fall asleep. <laughs> so, and I take it as a compliment. Um, anyhow, very soothing, very soothing. Um, you know... I'm a psychology professor, but I teach statistics. And um, some of the comments I've gotten on my videos are that I am either the Mr. Rogers of data science or the Bob Ross of data science. <laughs> <laughs> so very calm. <laughs> Anyhow, let me talk about this. I'm going to talk about data work and liberal arts. And my little secret clue here that this is a data presentation is the double ampersand, which is the logical and in most programming languages. So both of these things are true at the same time. Let me start, however, by saying who is Bart, aside from me, a few things. Number one, I have a PhD in social psychology. I also have an MPhil and an MA and a BS uh, in the field. I was in college for a long time. Um, I've been a UVU full-time professor for over 20 years. Um, I've been teaching for about 28 years, and uh, I, have, I have a one-class rotation. I teach Psychology 3110, Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences, which I have now taught 116 times, and the other 18 courses I've taught are 118, which means that in the spring, I will have taught stats more than everything else put together. Um, a little more is I also... And, and this is why I'm here today, why I'm a speaker here. I also am a frequent author for LinkedIn Learning. Now, that's a service that all of you guys have free access to because there's a university site license. 
and I make courses on them for statistics and data science. I've been doing this for about 13 years. Um, and I talk about programming. I talk about how data science is used in healthcare and finance and uh, sports and a lot of that stuff. So I do a lot of professional work there. Uh, one of the interesting things about that is I also am very active on LinkedIn. I post lots of short videos on there. Um, my daughter got me doing just TikTok videos, you know, holding up my phone and making short data videos. And um, including while I was riding my bike and didn't crash. But um, I also do twice a month, I do what are called live office hours on LinkedIn. I did one last night on various topics and I get an audience from around the world. Um, and it is really a fabulous way of connecting with people. It gives me an opportunity. I also have a company uh, called datalab.cc where I Similar to the video courses I make for LinkedIn, which are on um, uh, statistics and data science, I do the same thing at Data Lab, but with LinkedIn's blessing. Um, I don't sell them. I don't make any money through datalab.cc. I give that stuff away for free. But it is also a way that I connect with a huge number of people and has led to a lot of paid work for what I do also. Um, there are courses there that will, if you don't know how to use a spreadsheet, because I am going to talk about spreadsheets, you can learn how to use it there, and they're the downloadable files. It's, it's all there. I also sometimes work as a data consultant. I have worked for tiny nonprofits. I have worked for local business consultants. I have worked for several global corporations, and I've worked for the U.S. federal government um, doing data for them. Two other things about me. I actually studied design. Um, from the time I was a tiny little kid until I was a senior in college, I was going to be a designer. And I did an informal internship at General Motors, which served one of the important purposes of internships and tell you what you don't want to do. And so I kind of ran away screaming after that, switched over to psychology and still graduated in, you know, five years uh, total. Um, design is still very important to me. I did have a drafting table and I did use a French curve. Also, dance. And that's unexpected. But my wife is here. She's a modern dance choreographer. And several years ago, I took a sabbatical. And I spent a year at the U of U to study some of the elements of data visualization. It's an important part of data work. And I had most of it already. But there were some things I, that I still needed. But while I was there, I was enrolled in the certificate program in arts technology in the Department of Art and Art History. And I had to do a capstone project and I just got a Microsoft Connect, I hooked it up to my computer and I had dancers do short improvs, which we did uh, motion capture on them. And I turned that into this giant three projector gallery piece, turned it into some printed pieces to show at another gallery. And then that led to my wife and me getting commissioned by Repertory Dance Theater, one of the major modern dance companies in Salt Lake, to produce a piece for them. This is a still shot from that performance. And then I got a presidential fellowship for faculty scholarship here at UVU, and I spent two years working on live video looping and manipulation for modern dance performances on stage. It's fabulous work, and it is because of my interest in data that I learned how to do those things. Um, so, but why am I talking about data work and what does it have to do with you? Well, a few things. Number one, when we talk about data, you, uh, by the way, data is the British pronunciation. In America, we say data. I'm telling you that. Also, data is technically a plural noun because it's the, it's the Latin plural of datum. But it in English, it's a mass noun like air or water. And so you can say the data is. Anyhow, when we talk about data, the first thing that comes up for a lot of people is statistical analysis. And that's something I do a lot. It suggests number crunching. I do that. I know how to do it. I teach people how to do some of it. And it also just like random factoids. Here are some statistics about, you know, this year's graduating class. Boom, 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 boom. That's all useful. It's good. But there's much more to it than that. Now, there's a closely related field of data analysis, and it's broader than statistics. 
it includes visualization, which is a huge part of, I mean, just, and truthfully, just simple graphs, bar charts, line graphs, um, are going to get you maybe 90% of what you need. And then it also includes the interpretation of the data, which it turns out is the hard part. And that's something I'm going to talk about a fair amount today. And then if you want to go a step beyond that, there's data science. Now, data science is a new field, really came into its own about 10 years ago. And data science adds computer programming because it works with a lot of um, data that doesn't fit into the rows and columns of a spreadsheet. And it also has a heavy emphasis on an applied context, so in a business setting. And so the people, for instance, who develop the what are called recommendation engines, if you're on Netflix or if you're on Amazon, it says you might like this. That is a data scientist who created that based on your browsing history to make these other recommendations. Now, these days, those people are more often referred to as machine learning engineers, but it is still the same general field as data science. But why am I talking to you about this? Um, well, for a couple of reasons. Number one is, you know, you're in college, but you're going to not be in college one of these days, we hope, and you're going to be looking for a job. And one thing is, there are a surprising number of people with degrees in the humanities, social sciences, and liberal arts who have ended up being full-time data specialists. Degrees in data science are very recent. I'd say only within the last five years is it possible to get a degree in data science. Previous to that, everybody came from somewhere else. And often, you would think it would be computer science or mathematics. It wasn't. Some of the most influential people in data science came from political science and came from, uh, a, a shocking number came from astrophysics. Um, but they came from many, many different fields. And it is possible to be a specialist in this. Now, obviously, if you're going to be a full-time specialist in a field like this, you're going to need some additional training, need to go get a master's degree in the field. But you may also end up working in a field that is adjacent to data. So you might become a researcher. And so data isn't your full-time job, but it is an important element of what you do. So for instance, me, I, d I am not a full-time data scientist. What I ha do, however, is a lot of work that connects with it. And I can, and also I, I spend a lot of time talking with data scientists about things. And so you may end up in an adjacent field. And truthfully, there are massively more opportunities in adjacent fields. If you want to be the development director for a nonprofit, that's the person who raises money. You are in spreadsheets all day, every day. If you want to be um, a human resources director for a company, same thing. If you want to manage a, uh, an online social media business, same thing. Those are ones that you have to use the data in order to do the job well. So I think of those as data adjacent fields. You got to have it. And then this last one, MYOB, mind your own business. A lot of you, um, if you're, for instance, most of the students in my class, because uh, my class is in psychology and it's mostly students from I'd say the single most common goal of my students is to become a therapist, either a licensed clinical social worker or a uh, marriage and family therapist or a clinical mental health counselor. You're going to be a therapist. And for a lot of these people, the moment you become a therapist, you also become a small business owner. And it turns out that smart people who have specific professional training in their field don't necessarily know how to run a business. This is true of lawyers and dentists and doctors and accountants as well. And so the ability to work with data enough to take care of your own business is going to make a huge difference for you. I have made important business decisions based off a single bar chart. When I finally took the time to get some data together, put it all together, I saw like this activity pays really well this one doesn't. So we'll do more of this and less of that. But the real reason I want to talk to you guys about this is because data is human. Data is a human activity. Now, I have an event we call the Data Charette. I'll say more about it later. 
but this is our, we had stickers for this and it says data is love and community uh, driven data for good. Now there's a little bit of hyperbole in that. It makes a cute sticker, but, um, but here's the deal. Data is not something that is naturally occurring in the world. Data doesn't exist on its own the same way that like the height or the density of a tree exists. Data requires humans. Humans design the methods to find data, to store it, and to analyze it. And it doesn't exist until that happens. And it happens because data is used by humans to reach human goals. Okay, so ready? Again, data is not something that exists naturally in the world. It is created by humans for human tasks. Even if it's machine, I mean, most of the data gathered these days is like um, in warehouses as a box goes by and it gets scanned automatically and it goes on. But you know what? Yeah, a machine's doing that, but somebody created that machine. They created that technology. They created it to serve their purposes. And so it is fundamentally a human activity. And it gets us to the idea, you know the little saying, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, as a psychologist who can teach you the difference between sensation and perception, I will say you, there is a correct answer to that question. Falling trees do not make sounds. Falling trees make waves of air pressure. But for that to become a sound, you have to have a sense organ that is designed to receive it. You have to have a transduction process that converts it into a neural impulse. And you have to have a brain that is adapted to perceive and interpret sound. So unless you have those three things around, there is no sound. There's just variations in the air pressure. The same thing is true with data. You can say if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to measure it, does it make data? No, it doesn't. Because data... It will, it, it'll do stuff that could be interpreted as data, but there has to be a process. Somebody has to be there to measure it one way or another. I mean, you could just go in and say, like, how many trees fell down? So the trees are there, but it wasn't data until it got counted. And so that's the important thing. It's not something that exists out there. It is the result of a human activity. Now, there is a need. Data needs a story. So it can take form and fulfill its purpose. It is nothing until a human looks at it and interprets it. Okay. It's nothing until it is perceived and interpreted. And so the fulfillment of that need is we need humans who are story makers and the humans who study stories do it best. And I believe that people in the humanities, the social sciences and liberal arts are actually best situated to do that. Not just people in my field, psychology, or the broader social sciences, anthropology and social work, but people who write fiction, um, people who create films, people who study history. All of these things are important. I actually have more books of poetry in my office than I have on statistics. Um, and it's because I have gotten some of the best insights in my life into human nature from poetry um, or from movies or from, I remember I have a, I have a, I have a poet, I have a poem on my door. Um, I suddenly can't remember the poet's name, but it's called um, Having It Out With Melancholy. And it's about a person writing first person about their experience with um, uh, bipolar that manifests itself mostly as a soul crushing depression. And I think it is the best example I know of how it feels and how people should try to understand it. I remember seeing an opera a few years ago called The Long Walk, which was about a soldier from the war in the Mideast suffering from um, post-traumatic stress disorder. I felt that opera was the best illustration of the principle I had ever seen. And so... People who know how to tell stories, people who know how to take information and find the story in it are truly the ones who are in the best situation to make sense of data and to fulfill its potential. Um, I'm going to have a little brief interlude here on this to talk about um, dumpster fires or really horrible research that I have seen. And I had to be selective, okay? Because I've seen a lot of really crappy research. Let's talk about dumpster fire number one, the AI gaydar. 
So a few years ago, some people got the brilliant idea that they would develop a machine learning algorithm that could predict a person's sexuality from a single profile photo on a dating site. Why they thought that was a good idea is not clear to me, and whether they ever thought that this could potentially be used to harm people, um, again, never seemed to cross their mind. They thought, we're doing something, we're building something. By the way, this was the same people behind the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, where they were scraping huge amounts of data from Facebook for political candidates many years ago. Yeah, whoops. And yeah, so we have some people who don't consider the implications of their actions. But predicting sexuality from a photo. Okay, ready? They did, in fact, develop a method that was able to predict above chance whether a person was gay or straight. And so they saw that as success. And they claimed, if, for instance, in the case of men, they said, well, the reason we can do that is because gay men have been subject to in utero feminization and they've caused their faces to have different features, gave them smaller chins, larger eyes, a bigger forehead. And that's what our algorithm is picking up. And they're inventing this very elaborate theory about, and said, and that's what makes them gay. Well, um, some other people came by and looked at the same data, and they, they didn't actually say, hey, dumbass, but what they did say, it's the angle of the selfie. It's how high are they holding their camera? Many women know. If you hold your phone here when you take the picture, you're getting like the double chin or in, the, in your nostrils. But if you hold it up here, it looks better. Well, when you hold it up here, you have a bigger forehead. You have a smaller chin. <laughs> and so they invented this entire theory about hormonal hormones changing the structure of the face. Like, it's where you held your camera. You guys are familiar with Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one. And holding your phone a little higher is a much simpler explanation than um, this whole thing about changing the structure of the face. They also concluded that they had all these things about you know, predicting um, uh, lesbian women. And they, they also came back and said, like, it appears to be whether they are wearing glasses in the photo. <laughs> and have short hair and they're not wearing makeup. You know, surprise. And so there were these shockingly easy things. And you say, like, you did not need an algorithm to do any of this. Um, okay, so let's talk about dumpster fire number two, low birth weight. And I got this from a textbook on machine learning. And again, I, I do not cite the textbook because I'm trying to protect this person. But they wanted to run through this whole giant example of how to use machine learning to predict... Um, when a fetus was at risk of being born with a low birth weight. Okay, that's a really important thing to know. Because if you can predict that ahead of time, and if there's anything you can do about it, that can make, I mean, that's an actual life and death situation. That's important. And after their very long extended conclusion, they said, if they're twins or triplets, they're going to be smaller. <laughs> and once again, you go... Uh, you, you simultaneously wasted, you know, half an hour of my time, gave me a completely obvious solution, and it's useless because there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, ready? Here we go. Don't have triplets. Now, that's true. There is something you can do. If you're doing fertility, if you're doing in vitro, yeah, you have a higher risk of twins or triplets, but it, th there's nothing you can do about it. And I'm going to come back to that theme. Your analysis... When you get your conclusion, there should be something that you can do about it. Simply stating the obvious, if twins and triplets are smaller than singletons, is not helpful. Okay, dumpster fire number three. The goal here was to develop an algorithm to recommend sentences for people who have been convicted of crimes. Um, Again, by people who didn't necessarily take the time to think whether that was even a good idea in the first place. Well, they claimed that their super secret proprietary advanced, you know, method was ideal. By what criterion? We don't know. Um, it was predicting risk of recidivism, maybe, but it it was it was really problematic. Anyhow. Um, the uh, public service agency, ProPublica, came out and said, hey, guess what? We got the same data set, and we could recreate the accuracy of that thing with five sentences of if this, then that, if this, then that. 
five lines as opposed to this super secret proprietary machine learning mojo. Um, also, while I'm a big fan of AI and machine learning and data science in general, one of the most successful courses I have on LinkedIn is the one that talks about all the things that can go wrong and how social biases tend to just get replicated and exaggerated. One of the big problems that happens, and again, this is why I think that people in the, the liberal arts, the humanities and social sciences are important here, is because when people develop an algorithm, other people just go along with it and go, oh, the computer said so, the computer knows. No, the computer's full of crap. If you gave it biased data to start with, and all it does is reproduce the bias just in a much faster, more scalable manner, you have simply taken the problem and made it bigger. And that is true for so much. Um, I have a news feed and I get two or three stories every single day about uh, machine learning going haywire. Um, you know, they, the most amusing one, it's not machine learning per se, but it is technology going bad, is uh, there's a company that makes electric bicycles called Van Moof. And they're very fancy. And you use your phone to unlock them. And it, it's all very cool. Well, Van Moof went bankrupt. And suddenly, the servers that unlock the bicycles were not available. And so everybody who owned a Van Moof could not ride their bike. And so they were calling the police to say basically that Van Moof had stolen their bikes from them, even though it's right here, I can't ride it. Um, Van Moof got bought out by somebody else. I think they have maybe fixed that problem, but the idea is tech is not always the solution. And you have to think about some of the consequences of your actions. And again, people, and this is one, especially with people with a background in history, political science, you're going to say, we've been through this before. There's a problem. You need to be aware of it. Okay. And then let's do dumpster fires ad nauseum, where somebody gives you a data set and says, just analyze the data, find something. And so you go through it and you find random significant findings. And I put, I put significant in quotes there because you may, those of you who've had statistics know that that word has a very special meaning in statistics. It means a finding where the probability is less than 5% of getting that finding if the null hypothesis is true. And you have to say that whole thing. Um, but people don't pay attention to that. They get a significant finding. They think that means that it's big or it's important or it's meaningful. None of that is necessarily the case. So they say, well, I got the data and I found like four correlations that are, have a P less than 05. Here they are. And then the crash is nobody knows what to do with it. And it ends up just being junked. You know, this happens, right? I have recently meaning in the last month, read a report by a professional researcher that fell exactly into this category, where I don't know how many thousands of dollars of resources has been used in gathering the data and doing the analysis for that report, but when it was all said and done, it was completely useless. They kind of highlighted, well, here's this and here's that, but mm, yeah, okay, there you go. And you say, what, what, what do I do with it? So... This gets to the point of why this is relevant to you, and that's because you can work in data and you can build on your strengths. Here's, here's a few things I mean. I'm going to show you three activities rated from not so hard to harder to hardest. Not so hard is the technical skills. Anybody can learn to program in Python. It's the simplest language in the world. Anybody can do it. Okay, so when people say that they're pro Python programmers, sort of like saying, hey, man, I know how to write a complete sentence. You know, it's not that hard. You can learn how to write Python in a week. You can learn how to use a spreadsheet in three hours. The technical skills are not hard. Now, I understand that there is a craft to this, and there are people who take pride in it. But I would, again, I would say 90% of the work, you can learn how to do it in a few weeks. It's really not that hard. What is harder is understanding the organizational culture of the group that this came from and what sorts of answers work well for them. And what's hardest of all is developing critical thinking so you can avoid the uh, dumpster fires. The people who developed the AI Gator were technically extremely competent people, but functionally they were idiots. 
And they did not take the time to realize that they had gone straight off the deep end in their conclusions. Develop the algorithm. Great. That's wonderful. You know what? It's really for easy for you to get online and hire somebody to develop the algorithm for you. But interpreting it and using it responsibly it requires the kind of critical thinking that I believe that the liberal arts, the humanities and the social sciences, that's their specialty. That's the most important part. Um, there is a saying, and I have to break this up into four sections because it's a long saying, but th this is a well-known truism in the data world. It is easier to teach technical skills to someone who understands your organization, your business model, than it is to integrate a person with technical skills into your organizational culture. Take somebody who understands how the world works, teach them how to program. Much easier than taking somebody who knows how to program and teaching them how the world works. Okay, you guys are in a situation where you have special training in how the world works. That's going to be the critical part. The technical skills are not difficult. It took me years of graduate school to develop the way of thinking that has stayed with me ever since then. I picked up the programming on my own because it's not the hard part understanding the culture, the organization you're working in and understanding human nature and where things fit and what makes a useful response and what makes a useless response. That's the hard part. And that's why being educated is often much more important than having the technical skills. You can acquire the technical skills. Okay. The next thing is in terms of what your skills should specifically be focusing on when you're working with data is number one, what are the goals of the project? So often people get started on a project or somebody hires somebody to do a project without ever specifying what their goals are. And what this leads to is weeks or months of back and forth or waiting or wasted effort. One of the most important things you can do before you get started on a project is to know exactly what the goals are. So you know when you've reached them um, and to avoid extra effort. The other one is, can you interpret it? Can you make sense of it? Can you tell a story about the data? Now, I'm not saying like once upon a time, but simply being able to draw a thread. We want to know this, and so we got this data, and that connects with here, and it means this, except for when it breaks down this way, and this is what we do as a result. It's a simple story, but the ability to thread it through. I recently was paid a huge amount of money to develop a course for practicing business analysts. And I taught the course three times with people who worked for one of the largest corporations in the world, and they were professional analysts in that company. I would say that probably three out of the 50 people I worked with knew how to walk through the data so that you knew what they were saying and you knew what to do as a result of it. Many of the others eventually got it. Some of them, it was just, it was just bouncing off and it never got there. These are people who are employed professionally as data analysts. Um, and the last one here is when you work with data, you're trying to give people a roadmap. You are trying to say, do this. The phrase is actionable insights. And I know that that's a very jargony phrase, but it's an important one. In fact, I will say more about that. Actionable insights is the key term. Put that on your resume, your letter, app, uh, letter of application. If you say you know how to design an analysis for actionable insights, you're good. You got the job. Here's what we mean. What is somebody actually going to start doing, stop doing, or continue doing, but perhaps with more confidence now, as a result of your analysis? If you can't tell what changes as a result of your analysis, you have not accomplished your goal. What are they going to do? That's why it's called actionable insights. An insight is something that you find in the data. Oh, we found a pattern here, or we found a difference between two groups. Fine, that's nice, but what are people going to do? That's the actionable part. And until you can say what people will do as a result of your insight, you have not done your job, okay? Now, let's answer the obvious question. You know, doesn't ChatGPT do that? Can't we hire ChatGPT for free to do everything? Can AI do it? Um, I'm a big fan of AI. I have the paid professional account to ChatGPT, and I use it frequently. I like it, but there are issues. Actually, let me just back up. 
You guys are aware of the hallucination issue with AI? Are you aware of the lawsuits where lawyer, for instance, the, the best one is the, is the law firm that submitted a brief that they had chat GPT write, and it totally made up non-existent, non-existent cases and created citations for those. They submitted it to the judge, and uh, not only did the judge call BS on them, they got severely reprimanded for uh, submitting a work of fiction uh, as their brief. Um, chat GPT is very useful, except for when it isn't. And the problem is you usually have to know well enough. Um, you don't have to know what the right answer should look like. So for instance, I, I have people who have asked for ChatGPT to write some code in C++ and that it, it was doing fine until it stuck some JavaScript in there, which is a different programming language. Um, I have had it, um, I've had it, uh, try to come up with some statistical examples and it uses the wrong terms and it gives impossible calculations. You always have to check. ChatGPT doesn't do math. It does something that sounds like math. It resembles math. If you have the pre, if you have the paid version, you can hook it up to Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Alpha can do math, but you're going to have to pay 20 bucks a month to get that. Um, otherwise, it makes stuff that looks... It, it, ChatGPT is great at generating plausible answers, that they look like they're correct. Unfortunately, it is not ready to take over the world. Um, this right here is a report from LinkedIn. It's, it's, uh, they released a frequent one on the future of work report, and this one was specifically about AI. And this one was released in August of 2003, but it was all done in response to the November 2022 is when the AI world changed because that's when ChatGPT came out. AI existed before that. I mean, AI goes back to the 50s. Um, but the modern version of AI, which is based on deep neural networks and large language models, that's been around for a few years, but it wasn't until ChatGPT got um, released in November, which, by the way, was the exact same day that LinkedIn published my most recent course on AI accountability. So like, oh, great. Now it's all immediately obsolete. But um, the future of work report, by the way, that'll get you the PDF. Um, let me tell you a few things. 92%, 92% of U.S. executives agree that people skills are more important than ever. And this is a survey done right after, this is subsequent to chat GPT coming out, they're saying we still need people skills. And then here's LinkedIn reporting on the growth in demand for various job skills since November of 22, which again is when chat GPT came out. These are the four areas that have shown the most growth in job ads on LinkedIn. Look at this flexibility, professional ethics, social perceptiveness, and self management, none of which a computer can do. These are the things that people in the humanities, the social sciences, and the liberal arts specifically develop skills in. These are the most, in, or they, these are the ones that have shown the biggest growth. And if you want to know, in the U.S., again, this is according to the same report by LinkedIn, communication is the number one top skill sought across all job postings. Any of you communications majors? Way to go, you win. <laughs> but the ability to communicate clearly with other people is going to be the single most important thing. I have a sister who is um, who actually has a degree in communication, and she has worked in public relations for years and years and years. And but she has worked in the tech industry for the last thirty years, and. It started out with her doing legal PR for tech lawsuits, but now she has many clients in Silicon Valley. She lives in San Francisco, and she, she is training them how to talk on stage. They have to be able to explain their product or their service or their company to other people. And again, these are all very, very technically smart people. Um, and she is making something along the lines of 
half a million dollars a year teaching them how to communicate. So good job. Um, all right. So now what do I do? What do you do now? Okay. Here's a few things I'm going to recommend. Number one, think about it. Think about the possibilities that are out there. You might like it. When I started teaching in graduate school, um, I had this fellowship that was paying for grad school, but I, I was, I was sort of a useless fourth member of a research team. And I just kind of sit there and say like, I, I think you've got the period in the wrong place. You know, eventually my, my advisor said, you know, Bart, I think you should go do something <laughs> to earn your fellowship. And she said, maybe teaching. Now I was at a grad school that had no undergrads at the city university of New York graduate center. And so I had to shotgun paper letters out. Cause this was like pre email. Um, I had to shotgun out paper letters to all the undergraduate campuses that, uh, that were part of the city university of New York system. And I said, okay, I can teach like the following eight courses and I can do it for free cause I'm already paid. And I was crossing my fingers and saying, dear Lord, let it not be statistics or research methods, which of course is exactly what I was offered. And I was panicked. And when I was teaching statistics, I was barely ahead of the students for the first semester. The strangest thing is I have come to love it. Keep in mind, I'm a person with a background in design. I spent more time taking classes in color theory and drawing and 2D design. And I ended up loving statistics, even the calculation part of it. You never know until you're actually there. You have to try it. So think about it. You might like it. Think about some of the possibilities. Look what's out there. Also, pay attention. Just look around you and see places where maybe a little bit of data would help, where things look like they're not going very smoothly. Things look like they're kind of silly. See places where you think data might help them make decisions. This is... They're all over the place. Um, maybe they could do something with the parking lot. I don't know. But there's a lot of things you could do. Also, a little bit of statistics is nice. I keep saying that. I tell my students I will keep saying that. You don't have to have an enormous amount. But if you know what a correlation is, if you understand a basic regression model, if you know the effect of outliers you've got a great beginning. The statistics, again, is not the hard part, but you have to have at least some to go with it. And then spreadsheets. I'm going to give you a tool. Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets. No, seriously, really. If you can work a spreadsheet, a couple of things happen. Number one, you suddenly have an employable job skill. There are people out there, it doesn't need to be you, but there are people out there whose jobs consist of working in spreadsheets all day, every day. And if you end up one of those people, you can learn how to do what's called VBA, which is Visual Basic for Applications. That's a programming language that works within Excel. And then you can get your eight hours of Excel work done in one hour and go watch movies for the rest of the day. I know people who have done this. They specifically got a job that where they were in the building by themselves at night. They would launch their VBA script and literally go down the street and watch movies. Um, but they, had, they got all the work done. Um, Anyhow, a little bit of spreadsheets. In fact, I'm going to quote the Wall Street Journal on this one. Now, this is from 2015, but I do not think that this has changed appreciably. The key to a good paying job is Microsoft Excel, to which the article says the answer is yes. A little bit of spreadsheets can make a big difference. The nice thing about spreadsheets, though, is they're really easy to learn and you use them all the time. I had four spreadsheets open while I was preparing this presentation. I use spreadsheets every single day. And my, my favorite one, I got, one of my kids is here. Several years ago, my wife and I, um, we took our family on a trip around the world and involved 16 airplane flights. And our kids were young and we were going to places that were important to them. But also because kids are kids, I didn't want them arguing about who got to sit at the window seat. I created a spreadsheet. <laughs> that calculated how much time each kid would have at the window and making sure that they were there when we landed in a place that was important to them. And I showed it to them. I did my best to balance the time. We had some other constraints on it too, 
But, you know, really it was sort of thing like, I've thought about this and this is the best I can do, so please don't argue. Um, I use them all the time. Um, also, I have an event. We call it the data charrette. Now, charrette, which literally means a small cart in French, but it, it's a term that's used to refer to creative activity under extreme time pressure. And this is something that I've done several times in the past. And what it is, is in the past, we would do this over two days. We would partner with two local nonprofits who had data and they had a question, but they didn't know how to use the data to get their answer. And um, over two days, we would take their data, we would get it all cleaned up, which usually took a day and a half. And then we would go through the data and come up with an answer for them. As often as not, it reduced to making what's called a pivot table in, in a spreadsheet. A pivot table is a very employable skill. It's a way of collapsing the data in a way that makes it very easy to understand what's going on. We're going to be relaunching the charrette in November. So that is in about six weeks. And we're going to have two local nonprofits. We're going to be here on campus. It'll be a one-day event, just a Saturday. And we'll have food, and it'll be an opportunity for you to come and work with some data. Again, the data that we're working with is not going to be complicated. It's the making sense of things and telling a story about it. That's the part that we really need help with. And so when we do this event on Saturday, November 4th, and then again in the spring on Saturday, March 2nd, I would love to have you there. You can put it on your resume. One of the conditions I'm giving to the nonprofits is that they will also give a LinkedIn endorsement for anybody who contributes to their project. This is a great thing to do. So if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, now's the time to get one. Um, and so November 4th and March 2nd, we're doing these free events on Saturday. You get to work with data. It's, it's one of the most gratifying projects I've ever worked on. And with that, I am done. And here's my little link tree that has the links to everything else. But folks, thank you very much. Now, I realize that some of you have to go to class, but I, I am here for a few minutes if you have some specific questions. If you have questions, just raise your hand and we'll bring you the mic so that we can get it on the, the recording. Oh, yes. What did you study, like, where do you learn all the knowledge to know now? Say it again. What do you study, like, to know everything you know now? Um, so my degrees are in psychology. I have four degrees in psychology. I taught myself statistics. Um, and one of the things I think has actually been the best in terms of my professional ability, the reason I'm, is I have 30 years of experience teaching statistics to scared undergraduates who don't want to take my class. And so I'm able to find a way to make it approachable. And that has made a very, very big difference in my, um, in the work that I do. I said, Candida. What would be some advice you would give to students who are looking to make a jump from something like uh, psychology into learning more about sp uh, statistics? Okay, ready? Yeah. Know how to work a spreadsheet. Gotcha. I mean, seriously. Start with a spreadsheet. If you can make a bar chart, a line chart, a scatter plot, and a pivot table, you literally have 90% of what you need. You can, you can then use to learn, you can then learn to use a, um, an application like SPSS, or I actually prefer Jamovi, which is a free open source program that resembles SPSS. And you know, you can learn to use a programming language like R or Python, but that you don't need those to work with data. Again, start with a spreadsheet. Again, and just creating s some data in your own life. I mean, seriously, count how often you have, like, you know, 
how often you have to feed the cat, how often, you know, you got to change the temperature. Just start with data sets. You can get any of them. Just get started again. If you can make, if you can sort the data, if you can make a bar chart, a line chart, and a pivot table, you're great. Okay. Um, over the, I'm in my mid-40s. Over the course of my life, I've taken the Myers-Briggs personality assessment three different times, and something that kept kept coming up was counselor, some kind of counselor, counseling. So that's why I'm here in humanities. Um, but I've heard criticisms of that as like a pseudoscientific, kind of like the botched AI. Like how, how valid or credible or viable is that? You asking me about the MBTI? Yeah. I'm going to give you my take on most tests. Okay. They're great for starting a conversation. Okay. <laughs> and that's where most tests should end. Okay, thank they're, you. They're great for starting a conversation. One, one add on to that real quick though, and it, does, it ties in with what you talked about earlier, uh, being like the complementary to the tech world, like people need us, this people skills. Um, I had a career counselor uh, or interpret the results for me at Salt Lake Community College. I think they scrapped the program now, they don't offer uh. that anymore, but she gave me some really good insight and that was, you could go into a company with your people skills and be like the missing little link that they don't have and do just great, even though you're not like profoundly, you know, data driven or, or tech driven. Yeah. They need you. So like if you can get in there, you could, you could have that niche kind of job. No, I believe that's true. And I believe if you have just a small amount of technical skills, it, it, it works wonderfully. You know, there are so many examples of people who are who have risen to prominence in fields that require, you know, specific skills, it turns out that that person doesn't really have that much, but they are often, I don't want to even say his name, but Elon Musk, I don't know how smart that guy actually is. I don't know how much of this stuff he actually does. And I do think he's a total psychopath. Um, and so I don't want to hold him up as a model, but I think what it is, is he makes things happen. And he connects things and makes them happen. Again, I don't know what his actual contribution beyond being the motivator is to any of these things. But there are lots of others. One of the great American architects, Philip Johnson, was never a very great architect in and of his own. He's created like two buildings that are well known. But he was the mentor to an entire generation of America's most influential architects. He made those things happen. That was his contribution. Okay, we have time for one more question. Anybody? Why did you become so passionate in moving from psychology to data? It was it was a totally accidental change, um, not something I anticipated, and it's it's hard to explain. You know what's funny is my career has actually changed several different times, even while I've been in psychology the whole time. I spent several years studying uh, the legal system and restorative justice. Then I spent several years working on creative coding and art. Then I've been doing all the research. And this is all while employed here as a psychology professor. That's a nice, one of the nice things about being a data person, th th there's, a, there's, a, there's a great quote from one of the uh, guy named um, John Tukey. And he says, the great thing about being a statistician is you get to play in everybody else's backyard. Uh, you get to do all this other stuff um, and see whatever other people are working on. And I love doing that. And truthfully, it's because I actually get a lot of gratification from being helpful. And a lot of people get very panicky about statistics. And I feel that, you know, I, I sometimes joke that teaching statistics is like, you know, giving colonoscopies and the worst, you know, the best you can hope for is that people go, okay, it wasn't as horrifying as I thought it would be. <laughs> But I like being in a situation where I can help people make sense of something. And, and I know, that, for instance, a lot of people, they're, work, they're just working on their academic papers. They're like, I got data. I don't know what I'm doing. And be able to help them out and walk them through it, that, it's, it's enormously gratifying. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we hope you all enjoyed today's session and that you'll join us next month uh, for our next Degrees to Anywhere speaker. So watch your emails for that.